Uh, I think the commission put it nice saying the Equal Design Directive is a victim of its own success because you see more and more uh, uh, more and more uh, hope is put on the shoulders of the Equal Design Directive. First, like we discussed yesterday, it's a well-functioning climate policy. Now we want it to be a key instrument for the circular economy and resource efficiency. So yes, uh, it's a lot to live up to even for such a, an eminent directive. Um, now, very first, very quickly, I've been doing research on law and policy and evaluation for 20 years, and you can see a certain difference. When I started 20 years ago, it was voluntariness, corporate social responsibility, and today you see industry themselves even saying that we need some regulation often to make things happen. And uh, what I'm going to speak about here, uh, just for those who are not familiar what we mean with this fluffy concept of the circular economy, which is often very fluffy when we discuss it, uh, set uh, very quickly the scene, what do we mean with circular economy, what, how does it relate to European product policy, and then the Eco Design Directive a little bit on the developments related to resource efficiency and the discussion on what potential requirements that could be set and coming back to some tricky or contentious issues at the end. Now, uh, the, the most common definition of the circular economy is an economy that is restorative by design and keeps products, components, and materials at their highest utility and value at all times. It sounds a bit fluffy, and in, in a way it is, but what we want is about 90% of the stuff we make are waste within a couple of weeks. We're wasting our resources, and we want stuff to live longer. We want maybe our products to, to be longer lasting, to be upgradable, to maybe be maintained maybe remanufacture, etc., and in the last instance go to recycling or, or recovery. And we want to move up the waste management hierarchy here. And I think that's best exemplified by a story from my terrible childhood. I lived in a small city. We had black and white TV, kids' TV 30 hours a day. So you had to do something fun, and this is in the 1970s. And sometimes we went to the landfill, so this is on the left side, this is Swedish waste statistics. And of course the good story is we did a transition to then, to, from then, so today kids cannot go to the landfill because we don't have any landfills anymore, right? So the, the, the positive story is that we made one transition in our waste and resource policy. The bad story is that a lot of the material recycling is downcycling, poor quality recycling, and that we're also in a lock-in because we burn half our waste, so we're stuck in a lock-in that keeps us maybe from doing better stuff with that. But the circular economy is in the future we should have less waste for sure, and we should change the colors in here, so less stuff go to incineration, etc. So we need another transition. And in order to achieve this, we need certain things. We need better products and better materials, free from chemicals, better quality. We need new business models. We talked yesterday about selling Lux instead of selling lighting, or, or it could be about uh, leasing out baby clothes rather than sell them, or it could be about remanufacturing computers and cars, whatever. We, we need new business models that makes money out of better products. We need global reverse networks that are different from today, better at taking stuff back and doing things with them. And we need enabling conditions, and with that we mean policy interventions. And this is maybe hard for you to see, but in the Circular Economy Action Plan, we have loads of different policies outlined. But today, then, we're interested in the production and consumption, namely eco-design stuff of products and maybe labeling for consumers. Uh, informing consumers on on, uh, on the product characteristics. And we st see stuff is happening now. Uh, I wish I could make this uh, bigger text, but it's maybe hard to see. But what has really happened the last couple of years is that we have always in Europe for a long time our regulated chemical contents of product, the collection recycling of products, and the energy efficiency of products. What's coming up now is these different developments related to product durability and so on. And that is exemplified by the Eco Design Directive regulations that actually has a lifetime or durability obligations, which I'll come back to. It's also exemplified by the French ban on, on uh, or rather, a criminalization of plant obsolescence. And uh, then you have in different 
in different member states they have lower t vat on repair sectors you have in sweden for instance we have a lot of volumes of purchasing remanufactured products and so on so what we see is both mandatory standards and market-based approaches to to in different ways promote product durability and repairability so stuff is coming up happening and so on and what we did in the eco design directive we have certain we could say resource related standards that those includes durability standards for vacuum cleaners durability standards for lighting and voluntary agreement the voluntary agreement on imaging equipment also has resource related requirements they look a bit different if you look at vacuum cleaners they concentrate on the stuff that can break easily the hose and the motor lifetime this is quite different from lighting because durability in, in lighting are up to five to six different parameters it's switching cycles it's luminous flux over time it is uh, color rendering for some applications and uh, it, it the lamp survival factor simply so th there are different things here depending on the product groups what durability or lifetime is that is quite different and then as we said a lot of hope is put on the eco design directive so in the circular economy action plan the commission has said that we will promote repairability, upgradability, durability, and recyclability through this directive. And that is also, so that's said in the action plan, but also in the working plan for eco design. And also, it says that we will, the Commission will specifically consider durability information in future energy labeling measures. And then you label, you know how it looks like. So if we want to communicate lifetime information to consumers, that could be done in different ways. It could be done for voluntary eco-labels, existing labels. It could be done for including it in the energy labeling, or we could start a new type of voluntary label, for instance. Uh, and that is quite complex. And uh, we'll see the last presentation today how consumers could potentially react to labeling option. But we can see that many actors agree. In principle, it's good if consumers get this information, but in reality, it's very hard to, to set this. And depending on the product group, what lifetime is can be quite different. Then if we come back to the Eco Design Directive on mandatory eco design standards, there's a, no a number of them discussed in different reports. Um, and, th and they could be related to durability, repairability, modular design, which we'll have a Karsten speaking about later, ease of disassembly, which the next speaker will talk about. But there could also be other types of quite different stuff. If you look at server use, maybe you need availability of firmware updates, stuff like that. Could also be critical materials and so on. So there are different approaches to material efficiency affecting different life cycle phases here. And this one is also a bit small, but one of the big issues uh, is we need standards to set these requirements and often we do not have them and that's why there are now mandates out to the european standardization bodies how on standards for material and resource efficiency requirements so and i think the next speaker will perhaps get a little bit into this but what do we mean for instance on durability in this case for a for a washing machine uh, you need some kind of standardized endurance test for instance to test durability and so on so all, you will always need a standard to to uh, prove compliance with something so uh, the political perspective then is i try to make some kind of fr uh, preliminary framework but the potential to adopt eco design standards will they will decide both on the eco report tool the preparatory studies the review studies but also the political context as, as such for circular economy and the support for these types of standards. And of course, it's depending on standardization development and also other research and knowledge coming in, for instance, life cycle aspects and trade-offs, which will also be discussed later today. Is it always good to, to prolong the lifetime of a product, for instance? And I'll skip this 
<laughs> details, what I just try to do in some cases, talking to industry and so on, is that all potential standards have potential advantages and disadvantages. Uh, that's hard to, I mean, most of them have certain advantages to support our, uh, certain policy objectives, but they also have uh, disadvantages. And just to take one example, recycled content in a product. If we say that products should, should have recycled content, that could support our second-hand waste markets. But they also bring a number of problems. Supply, uh, manufacturers don't like them because they create uncertainty and dependence on resource providers. And they also may mean that we cannot no longer check this on the product. Recycled content may need supplier declarations and that is a different approach than we have today on verification. And some major issues, uh, and some will be discussed today then, is we need, we need the data, we need standards, we need to think of the potential conflicts between different environmental aspects if we promote, for instance, durability. Industry often claims that these are dangerous stuff. You can hinder innovation if you are too, uh, if you are too, if you don't think through this properly. One problem I, I noticed in interviews with industry is that there could be social and economic gains with some of these standards, but the way we set up our waste systems, producers will not get their stuff back, and that's something they say might be social and economic gains, but as a producer, I gain nothing from, for instance, increased recyclability, because I will not get my stuff back anyway. Uh, some of them, if we go for some stuff like recycled content, we need supply chain verifications, and that's not how we worked with EcoDesign in the past. And also one question is, can we really have a preventative approach? One problem we're always worrying about is we, we do catching up, right? So people might say, you cannot recycle these rare earths now. Uh, it's not cost effective, but, but maybe it will be in 15 years from now, and then we need to think now how we design the stuff so we can actually take it out then. So we're always chasing a little bit, I think, behind. So that's it from me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Carl, for this uh, this overview. Maybe one uh, specific comment on an item where I think there is a kind of, uh, and already for a long time, a kind of misconception, and and that is about the uh, how to regulate or or what to do with the durability, the lifetime of products. And there, I think the issue is not so much that we cannot, uh, say, measure lifetime of products, uh, because we, uh, as you mentioned, for the lighting, uh, there are some criteria and, uh, well, measuring is in principle easy, uh, because you switch on the lamp and you switch it off uh, in a certain pattern and then you uh, measure whether these 6,000 hours are, uh, are completed. And the same you could do for a washing machine. The major problem is, of course, that uh, for effective uh, market surveillance, uh, a 6,000 hour test or for washing machines, if you want to simulate a, say, 12 year lifetime, uh, a one and a half year test is, is not practical. So. Unless, and, and so the development should not be on uh, can we measure uh, lifetime in general, but can we envisage uh, a lifetime test that, that can be much, much shorter uh, so that it's, it's practical, <coughs> applicable. And unless we have that, uh, I don't think it's useful to, to have these requirements in, in eco-design because they can be, uh, can be enforced. And so the tendency in the discussion now uh, for the revision of the light sources is to get away from these 6,000 hours because they are not, uh, not meaningful. So that's a short remark on, on lifetime uh, uh, measurement and requirements. Carl, yeah. any comments on that? No, I mean, I'm, there are many lighting experts. I'm not one of them, but I know, of course, they try to do some stress testing and stuff now, right? So to try to get a little bit away from that but like you said it's tr tough to have the lamps in your basement for for these hours uh, in their laboratory and click them on and all. I mean of course it's tricky and that's why they do some stress testing and uh, 
uh, yeah, it's uh, hard to disagree with you. That is one of the big challenges, I, I guess, to, to, to do that. Any more questions? Uh, please mention your name as well. Hi, it's Lido. I work for the uh, UK Department for Environment. I guess um, what I was w interested in is your point about um, motivation for producers and how that's uh, that's a challenge. Um, I think maybe one interesting. Uh, you you um, Oh, if I give it a shake, maybe it works a little bit. Thanks. Uh, is uh, one of the proposals in the circular economy package is around um, uh, extended producer responsibility and you'll probably be aware that there's a, an element in that around fee modulation potentially um, which is where you can potentially reduce the um, the cost that's imposed onto producers if you can demonstrate material efficiency or if you can demonstrate um, design for disassembly that kind of thing um, but the critical problem that they have is how do you demonstrate that and how do you verify those sorts of things so that you can decide how much of a fee you would, uh, you would modulate. Um, and here you've got the, the opposite problem, which is you're designing standards, but you haven't necessarily got that link through to, to producers. So, I mean, I guess I was wondering if there was any reflection on whether anyone's thinking about how those two things can potentially be lined up. I mean, there is a big problem in the sense that a lot of the time the products that are dealt with by those two different areas are different. So producer responsibility will pr principally deal with packaging and, well, and we and end-of-life vehicles and the... Uh, the Eco Design Directive looks at uh, uh, products based on e energy efficiency, uh, principally at the moment. But whether or not there's potential in the long term to link those two together, because it seems that they're looking at the same sort of thing. Yes, and there I know there are some people here who might have more elaborate views on this. I don't know if Jessica, if you want to re reply, but that's be one of our struggles uh, because. I mean, I'm in a research institute where we've done a lot of research on producer responsibility. And you could say in the old days, uh, maybe I'm simplifying, so you have to excuse me. But in the old days, of course, many producers wanted just to get rid of the problem. So you have producer organizations, you set up cost-effective schemes. And then lately, some producers said, maybe we made a mistake. Maybe we should have had a scheme where we can get our stuff back. Because especially some years ago when resource prices went up, the economics become different. That, that's a maybe simplified storytelling, but a little bit. And then we have said, okay, if socioeconomic gains are not equal to produce gains, then maybe we need equal design to supplement the, the EPR market-based drivers, you could say. And there are some thinking on this, and uh, I think my colleagues are better when it comes to these incentive schemes, but you could, of course, have minimum standards, and you, like you said, you could support it through reduced taxes or other measures to, to complement. And I think there's some research on this, but it's not very elaborated. I don't know, Jessica, if you want to add something. I know France is, is doing the modulated fees, but we haven't got much back on how that's working. And they only did it in, in some groups where they could actually measure something. I think some of the other research that's presented today is going to be more on how do we actually measure some of these uh, design for recycling or design for disassembly? And I think that is a, a key component missing. But I think that we can watch what's happening in France. And I think a lot of us working in EPR are watching what's happening in France and trying to see how that, how that goes. Um, but I think it's a good idea that's worth uh, maybe we have a few more member states going with that and see it on a, on a wider level. Yeah. Uh, Carl, I just wanted to mention uh, credit to the transformer industry and probably the motor industry as well, who uh, certainly on transformers anyway, it's 100% recycling. You know, they, when they take a transformer out of service or the scraps that they use in manufacturing, they take that material and they, they recycle it because it's enormously valuable. The copper, the aluminum, the metal that's used in those, and even the oil uh, is used. So um, I, I, don't, I don't think it's all doom and gloom on, on products. It probably is quite product specific. But the materials that go in and the value of them at the end of life is, is obviously an important driver. Just a comment. I think there's a natural driver in many. We work a lot with Volvo car remanufacturing, Volvo group remanufacturing. And in those, many of these sectors like aviation, there's a natural drive to remanufacture also. And that industry is really ex growing every year. And then we have loads of other sectors where we see nothing of the kind. 
obviously. And then we have other sectors where we're super worried, like textiles. A lot of it is e-commerce, and people don't want it. They send it back, but they don't want it back, so they burn it, etc. So, yeah, I agree. You need a sector-oriented approach when you look at these things, I think.